Hello, everyone. We have a special podcast today with Drachi Niffel. Hello. <laughs> and he is the naval expert. If you don't know his channel yet, be sure to check it out. And we will talk about the effectiveness of World War II coastal batteries. And this is part of a bigger podcast, which you can find or video on, on his channel, which we will, of course, link in the description. So when we look at the Second World War and I mean, most people probably think about coastal artillery, they will think about the Atlantic War and Normandy yes. and everything. So in general, how effective did turn out the German and also the Japanese coastal defense? I mean, there's also other places where it were more effective initially, like um, near Oslo, where the Blücher yeah. was sunk. So. Yeah, I mean, as we covered in the uh, in the earlier parts of the video, um, a lot of it comes down to how much money were people willing to put into the coastal fortifications and what was the caliber of the fortifications relative to the, uh, the caliber and durability of the ships that they were fighting against. So yeah, you've, you mentioned the, the earliest experience was um, the, the, the Hipper class Blucher versus uh, the otherwise obsolete um, Oscarborg fortress in near Oslo that's kind of a almost a case in point of exactly how not to engage uh coastal defenses because albeit that the guns were ostensibly obsolete they were still 11 inch armor piercing <laughs> guns ironically enough made by Krupp um and that's not a gun that you put a heavy cruiser into close proximity of I, as far as I can recall, the Germans thought that the fortress being obsolete was also not unmanned, which was why they let the ship get so close in the first place. But it, it then meant that once those guns opened up and started to score hits, uh, the Blucher was in serious trouble. And then, ironically enough, um, getting hit by whitehead torpedoes that were obsolete when the high seas fleet had been around. But hey, explosive is explosive. And at that kind of short range, it was a bit it was a, a bit stuffed but at the same time that was a case of a surprise attack um other norwegian coastal fortifications they did manage to damage one of the german konigsberg class cruisers but in general they were able to be suppressed where they were known and obviously um norway would eventually be invaded and that actually brings up another issue with coastal fortifications is that they can only defend so much space and so in if a battery particular gun battery is especially difficult to get rid of you can land troops elsewhere if you can find a landing space and go around them um because if you if the guns are there to defend a city and you can take the city without going in through the main harbor then that gun battery is pretty useless because it, it can fight but it can only fight to do just for the purpose of killing more enemy troops it's it's already failed in its primary objective so basically the problem was an intelligence failure on the German side. Yeah. Well, it doesn't, doesn't particularly surprise me sometimes because German <laughs> intelligence is, is not, was often not their strong suit besides from the crypto analysis and crypt yeah. cryptography. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you've got, you've got other experiences, um, on both sides of, of success. So, um, the the next major bit of coastal fortification that's engaged is the the 15 inch guns emplaced at singapore when the japanese invade um and again the it's kind of the, almost a similar thing to the eventual fate of norway in that the japanese take one look at it and go why would we possibly want to take our amphibious forces into range of five 15 inch guns um because these guns are obviously still very much current lethal weaponry they're not going to bring cruisers destroyers and amphibious assault ships into into play against them so they invade from the north and although some of the guns then are used against the uh, japanese forces then primarily designed to uh, engage ships so their their stock is mostly armor piercing shells and uh, not high explosive so they're not terribly effective against land, against uh, spread out infantry. So so basically, this this is a myth because I always read that they couldn't turn the guns due to um due to the the firing arc or something, but it was mainly an ammo problem or both. 
Yeah, I mean, some of the guns couldn't be turned because of where they were positioned. Um, and the guns, you'd, you'd expect if you had, I mean, it's like even a railway gun, which is generally seen as the biggest kind of land-based artillery, um, even a railway guns are generally sort of eight to 10 inches. So 15 inch guns, you think, oh, well, like five 15 inch guns, that's got to be able to have some ferocious effect on uh, invading troops. And armor piercing shell, not so much. I mean, it's like if you were hit by enough 15 yeah. inch armor piercing shell, you were very, very dead. Um, but um, firing it at sort of a target where you're going to hit the ground the shell would probably go 15, 20 feet, if not more, into the ground, yeah. then explode. There'd be a tiny little puff of dirt and uh, possibly a dead mole or two. <laughs> and uh, and that's it. So as far as as far as a lot of the Japanese were concerned, they weren't being fired on because where where was the sort of several hundred kilogram high explosive that they expected to be blowing them to pieces? And yeah, and so a, a lot of Japanese soldiers believed and the, a lot of reports said well actually these batteries never fired on us because yeah I say like, wh where were the explosions where's the mass ca mass casualties um but they, i mean they, they were there but yeah they, they they weren't designed they weren't designed or stocked to fight that kind of engagement and uh, so they weren't particularly effective especially because i say the japanese just didn't show up with the ships that they were <laughs> that everyone was supposed to send against them yeah so that that's singapore the next would be Wake Island, if I'm correct. Yes. Yeah, Wake Island. And again, Wake Island is a good example of um it's a it's a good example of how to defend your uh coastline because they keep the emplacements as concealed as possible, which is one major thing, because if your emplacements aren't concealed, they obviously they can be shelled, bombed, strafed, etc. before you especially in World War II once aircraft come into play. Um so they keep them concealed, but also the Japanese kind of help by sending in transports, destroyers, and the occasional very small light cruiser. Um, so although the Wake Island battery is five inch guns, they are quite successful at tying up the Japanese um, from uh, from being able to invade they repulse the, the the japanese invasion forces at first and although obviously ultimately uh they can't hold them off forever um that initial that initial counterattack serves quite a number of tactical and strategic purposes could you elaborate on that yeah so um i mean obviously some japanese warships and transports are hit um they managed to sink a destroyer, which is always a, a good thing. Um, but it also means that because the Japanese forces attacking Wake Island were delayed, they were slowed slowed down, they expected to take it a lot sooner. It meant that in conjunction with a number of other successful coastal defences, it meant that the American forces would, were still present for a lot longer. And that allowed for various uh, radio interception efforts and in other intelligence gathering efforts to take place whilst American forces were still in the vicinity of Japanese forces, which would then go on to be quite decisive in a number of later engagements. Um, the Wake Island campaign is is just one of them. The, the one of the uh, the other major one is uh, when the Japanese invade the Philippines. There is an example of what is pretty much, as we were discussing earlier, sort of the, the, this whole cost issue. You have Fort Drum at the at the um, entrance to Manila Bay. Fort Drum is an example of somebody actually going, you know what, we are actually going to spend as much, if not more, on fortifications as we would on an actual battleship. And that is dictated almost entirely by the location because the Philippines are way over the other side of the Pacific, as probably everyone's aware. Um, for most of the interwar period, the US Navy is based on the US West Coast. So there's absolutely no way they can ever get reinforcements over to the Philippines faster than the Japanese could attack. And even once they move to Pearl Harbor, they're still much further away from uh, Manila, Manila Bay than the Japanese ever would be. 
and there's absolutely no question of basing the US fleet in the Philippines. Um, so that means they have to take a long, hard look at their defenses and go, hang on a minute. We know we cannot bring our mobile heavy artillery in the form of battleships to bear soon enough. We have to have effectively a stationary battleship. And this is what Fort Drum is. There are a lot of people that call it the concrete battleship, and it is literally just a massive amount of concrete. It's got a full-on battleship style at the time American, so it's, ca it's a cage mast with fire control equipment. It's got power generators. It's got case-mounted secondary batteries. It's got a couple of twin 14-inch gun turrets. Um, if you kind of squint and look at it a little bit oddly, you you could be forgiven for thinking it might be some kind of especially weird late 19th century pre-dreadnought. Um, and it proves incredibly durable. The Japanese come up against it and they cannot take it or destroy it, no matter how hard they try. Um, but again, as with Norway and as with um, Singapore, Fort Drum ev eventually falls victim to the fact that it can only be in one place at one time and the Japanese invade the Philippines from not there um, and end up taking Manila by land, at which point the fortress is guarding something that the enemy's already taken. So the, the American gun crews, they spike their guns and eventually surrender. But between that defense um, and Wake Island, it means say it means the Japanese schedule is pushed back quite significantly. Interesting. Did, did Fort Drum sink any? ships of the japanese navy offhand not that i can recall but in some ways that's more of a testament to its ridiculous uh, durability and reputation in that the in that the uh, japanese took one look at it and just went we ah they didn't even try to, yeah it's like we want nothing to do with this um, that they, they they did give it a, a bit of a go um they, but it, they very quickly realized there was no way that they were going to successfully um, take that thing out. I mean, they, they did shell it with artillery um, quite a bit, but it's a, it's a massive lump of concrete. And uh, yeah, the, the ships they could have brought in, like, say, the Nagato or something like that, to actually engage it, they, they didn't want to risk, risk it. Yeah, um, understandably. Basically, the next would be Japanese and, and German defense, or is there anything in between? I think coastal-wise, the next big thing pretty much is the Atlantic Wall. Um, I mean, the Japanese, they take a little bit of a theme off of uh, the sheer resilience of uh, the American uh, fortifications, especially Fort Drum. But, and ironically enough, actually, Fort Drum, occupied by the Japanese, although it doesn't have its big guns anymore, is one of the last places in the Philippines to fall when the Americans counter-invade. But they, the Japanese t suffer from the problem that when they are attacking, Fort Drum in part is so successful because the Japanese do not have everything at hand that they need to, um, to actually take out the fortification. Whereas when the Americans come back um, yeah. with the sort of near infinite numbers of uh, Essex class carriers and battleships all over the place. And everything else in between. Yeah, it's kind of like the Japanese have various coastal fortifications they put up. None of them last very long, um, partly because they don't have the, the guns themselves in general are tend to be more what in naval terms would be defined as cruiser grade weapons six inch guns eight inch guns things like that so they're not really much of a threat to battleships anyway who can just happily sail up and blast them but also the, the carriers just send in vast numbers of bombers and again it's that whole problem of it's a fixed target you only have to throw so many bombs at it especially using dive bombs before you'll hit it hit it and take it out the the atlantic wall is probably the one we want to come on to next except for there is one sort of side sort of side diversion from the Atlantic Wall, which is the Dover Strait guns. Ah, yes. Um, they're, now, they're, they're a very funny little uh, set of guns because it's peri periodically the case with, where Britain and uh, the Nazi forces would shell each other across the Strait of Dover. 
Um, ah, yeah, I act. Yeah, I, I know a bit of. Or I know that the, I actually thought they were hit, not hitting. I mean, I knew that the Germans had guns that fired over there, but I didn't know that it was basically a counter battery firing each other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's again, the these batteries show the best and the worst of um of, of coastal defenses because the of the cost issues of they're not built like miniature battleships it means they're much slower firing um although the guns there are apart from the uh the 3 16 inch guns that they bring in which were designed for the h39 battleships um all the other guns are le lesser caliber than the sort of 15 inch guns that you'd find on a bismarck or something but those guns are much much slower firing than battleship guns uh, and heavy cruiser guns because the sort of the power loading equipment and everything that you'd find on a warship isn't there but then again at the same time it's an engagement that literally goes on for years so the fact that your rate of fire is measured in rounds per hour or rounds per day is not so much of an issue so basically they shot each other for years but with not much difference i assume during the channel dash they tried to suppress them or yeah, so um, the the German batteries would take pot shots at various convoys um, that came through the Dover Straits, but not so, not with great success. During the Channel Dash itself, the British batteries um, do try and take out uh, the the German ships as they come through the Straits of Dover, but they run into the issue that because of the weather conditions, sort of fog and rain and stuff, they can't actually see the German ships. So they have to rely on radar set, and so they go for radar directed firing. The problem they have is that although the radar is um, advanced enough to give them a firing solution, it's not advanced enough to spot the fall of shot. It's ah, not advanced enough to pick up the shell splashes. Yeah. So it's kind of like they know what the radar says they should be doing, but they're not sure whether it's correct, and they have no way of telling. So um, they fire off couple of hundred shots at the Shan horse, the Gneisenau, the Prince Eugen and everybody else. But they're consistently hitting about a mile or two behind where the German ships are. Um, so there's an awful lot of churned up ocean and dead fish, but no actual effect on, on the German ship, uh, guns themselves and the ships even. And then at the end of, near the end of that uh, particular engagement, the German guns on the French side start firing at the British guns, and so they they kind of end up fighting, sort of shooting at each other, whilst everybody goes about their merry way in the channel. <laughs> that looks like an interesting thing for a comic, to be honest. Yeah. Oh yeah. So um, yes, thousands of shells were flung e e either way um, in those in those uh, engagements. Eventually, again, most of that battery. Is taken out during, uh, after the D-Day landings. Although eventually, um, some of the British heavy guns do manage to take out one of the heavy German batteries. Um, there's a German battery of 11-inch guns that gets hit by uh, 14 and 15-inch gunfire from the British side. But uh, there's still the 16-inch guns. There's some 12-inch guns, and there's some old 210 millimeter of guns as well. Sort of 8.2, 8.3 inch guns that uh, are only ever silenced by um, allied forces actually invading the area. Yeah, I mean, again, it's a case, in some ways, you could almost consider them a land-based version of the Tirpitz, um, <laughs> in that, like, that ship managed to tie up so many allied forces simply by existing in Norway. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, the, uh, the mere existence of the German guns meant that the British uh, certainly Churchill felt res re compelled to respond and uh, they put a couple of 14 inch guns and a couple of 15 inch guns which obviously could have been used elsewhere they put them into into counter battery operations so again it's a case of tying up enemy resources just as much as actually hitting anything yeah what what was the was the amount of effort comparable with, with against the tirpitz no um, no, no. It's uh, well because the thing is, once once you both sides have their big guns in place, it's kind of a just a kind of well, we we'll lob shells yeah. together, yeah, and and hope at some point we hit something. Um, the Germans had slight slight upper hand in that respect, in that 
you had Dover and the associated towns which were in range of them, whereas there wasn't really um, a kind of a, a comparable target town or city sized target that the British could shoot at. So the German guns kind of split their attention between shooting up the town, um, shooting at coastal convoys and things like that, as well as the British guns, whereas the British guns basically just had the German guns to try and shoot at. So let's move to Normandy. And here mm. I actually have in front of me a, a, a document from the 8th of April 1944 from the high command of the German army and the note about um, that they know from landings in the Pacific about the Americans that all their landings um, have strongest air support and additionally artillery and rocket fire from battleships. And as such, they, they note, also they note that a lot of smoke will be used so that the guns should be able to fire even if everything is, on, uh, is smoked up. Yeah. And uh, so that that would have been a, a mixture of remote spotters, kind of like what we, what the Canopus did in World War One. So you would have had spotters out away from the, the guns to be able to re report the fall of shot, probably by radio at that point, um, or possibly by landline as well. When so the spotters are out of the smoke, and also um, I suspect they would have also looked into radar guidance or at least radar range finding. Um, because yeah, the smokes is two is 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 a twofold thing. One of which is that obviously it, the Allies would try and use it to obscure the ships, and but also the Germans were very capable when it came to using smoke to conceal their own positions. Um, obviously, they used it to conceal their own ships. That's why one of the reasons why Tirpitz lasted so long um, in Norway. But also, if you if you can fire your guns through a smoke screen, it makes the enemy's job a lot harder to counter battery you and in that respect actually a hidden uh coastal battery hidden behind smoke actually has a an advantage over uh, a ship hidden in smoke because if you have radar you can still spot a ship that's hidden in smoke whereas if the ship has radar you can't spot the gun battery because it's just a another land feature Ah yes, and I guess, I guess the the radar wasn't good enough to spot yet the the shots in the air. Uh no no that's uh that's a, that's much later down the line. So <clears throat> you you'd basically be back to the old old World War One thing of well we saw a gun flash in that general vicinity, maybe we will try and fire somewhere in that area, but then you have no idea whether you've hit long short left or left or right. Yeah yeah and I guess uh listening yeah no doesn't work neither in this case. So so the thing is about DD we know that the allies lost very few ships at least besides the the landing craft itself. Mm. So in general the Atlantic war was not particularly effective and why was it? I mean I I never looked directly at the Atlantic war I did once how mm. um a division is set up there to defend an an area but about the whole coastal guns, I only know basically a bit of the propaganda footage. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the problems they had was uh, sort of as we were discussing the very first part of uh, the sort of the building up the history of coastal defenses was the fact that there were multiple landing sites across Normandy. Um, some of the heaviest guns were already at the Calais battery firing across the Dover Straits. And so they could have various smaller. Uh, batteries all along the Normandy coast and so forth but because they could never guarantee where the Allies were going to land they couldn't concentrate large numbers of guns in any one place so when the Allies did show up um, they could only be engaged by a small portion of the Atlantic Wall which obviously didn't help very much. The, the guns that were there um, some of them were fairly heavy um, but again there, there was a mixture of uh, weapons that had old sort of World War One vintage weapons uh, that would have seen service on sort of old German armored cruisers, things like that. Um, they had a mix, some interwar guns, and they also had uh, adopted a couple of uh, pre-war French fortifications that had the biggest guns that were present in the area, 13.4-inch guns nicked off of a French battleship. But again, it was kind of a case of overwhelming force. 
the Allies knew that these coastal batteries were there. And again, that keeps coming up, that thing of if you know where your enemy's fortifications are and how big they are, you can afford to dedicate overwhelming force to them. So they, they were attacked by air, they were attacked by sea, um, the Allies rolled up with multiple battleships of their own, all, obviously all with sort of 14, 15 and 16 inch guns. So you had you had a couple of the R-Class there, you had uh, War Spite was there, obviously on the American side you had Texas there, Rodney spent a bit of time offshore as well, um, the Nevada, it's like the Allies had more heavy guns present on their battleships than the Atlantic Wall batteries in that area had heavy guns in their own, and obviously the Allies could use aerial spotting because they had aerial superiority and such to to try and increase the accuracy of their guns but they 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 were taken as a very serious threat um obviously once you have a battleship that's um engaging you your heavy battery has to respond to that because otherwise sooner or later you're going to get hit so you need to either drive them away or or hit them yourself so yeah it, it's so again it's one of those things of in as much as their objective of stopping the landings was concerned no they were not very effective in as far as their objective of forcing the en- uh, of a sort of, I guess, a secondary objective of forcing the enemy to expend more resources than otherwise, you could argue in that case they they were more effective because you had half a dozen battleships engaged purely in suppressing the Atlantic Wall guns, and then you think about the slaughter on Omaha Beach. How many of those troops might not have been machine gunned down if you had half a dozen battleships pouring fire into the machine gun pillboxes? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so basically, driving away firepower from 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 the fleet towards the big guns instead of the the minor defenses that actually churn up the infantry. So, mm. what what happened with most of these batteries? Were they taken out? Were they suppressed? Or were they taken out by aerial assault? Or were they shot up by by the naval bombardment? Or were they mostly or was it like were they incapacitated by destroying the fire control directors or um, it, it was a mixture. Some of them, some of them were directly, eventually counterbatteried by Allied battleships, um, and then they were either disabled or destroyed in in that manner. Um, a few of them were, well, a few of them were deliberately targeted for early early um, removal by uh, landing troops uh, to varying degrees of success, um, and others were just inevitably overrun because. So some of these duels ended up going on between the battleships and the Atlantic War Gun. Some of those duels ended up going on for days. Oh, um, and by the and by the time that was over, either they'd been knocked out or Allied troops had gotten off the beaches and were advancing on them. And it was a case of, well, okay, well, we can't stay here anymore. <laughs> you can't take the gun with you, so you just have to leave. So, in, in some cases, you say the duels went on for days. In this case. Were there was there combat effectiveness in terms of 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 scoring hits so low, or did the the ships change out? What happened? Uh, the ships would cycle back and forth, um, which which and obviously they were moving targets. Um, because and again, it came back to this whole cost issue of uh, because they hadn't the, because the coastal batteries hadn't been built to the full expensive standards that they would have been if they had been full battleship turrets their rate of fire wasn't spectacular which obviously limited the number of chances they had to score hits and of course having incoming enemy battleship fire is somewhat distracting the they they did score a few hits um there was a 9.4 inch battery that uh, were engaged the texas and a, another american battleship Eventually, uh, they did get a couple of hits on the Texas, but the Texas scored multiple hits in return, which knocked the battery out. It was kind of this issue, again, of the level of firepower that was brought to bear, not just in terms of number of guns, but also in terms of the fact that you're talking about 14, 15, and 16-inch guns on the Allied side. And in that particular area, the biggest that you had available were those old 13.4-inch naval uh, French naval guns. Um, all the other guns were smaller, so their ability to damage the ship in return was less yeah. because their armor-piercing capability wasn't as good, but also their range was less. So um, to a certain extent, the 
allied ships could if they wanted to stand off and engage beyond their range but obviously they, they'd want to close in as close as they possibly could to ensure better accuracy but it meant that you could have something like the war spite or the nevada or the rodney engaging at what for them was point blank range but what for the german battery might still be fairly long range um and therefore the flight the flight of the shells is different obviously if you're if you're using a sort of an eight or nine inch type gun you might be having to fire ballistically which means sort of at high angle which means that your your area of drop is very much smaller and therefore your level of accuracy is less whereas if you're if you're at the same range with those triple 16 inch guns or twin 15s you're firing a lot more straight and level which makes yeah. makes targeting out easier in the first place but also the fall of shot uh, zone is much larger so the more chance for you to hit yeah and then better spotters and everything yeah uh, yeah it, it kind of makes sense so i mean one german military historian referred generally to the to the artillery that the germans had in normandy and everywhere on the atlantic well basically to a to an european artillery museum because they had everything yeah. there and so yeah they had, they had such a large area to cover they were it was literally what can we possibly spare dash steal from somewhere <laughs> um yeah because any, anything is better than nothing so basically with the atlantic war we basically have a, a counter invasion defense that tries to cover nearly everything in comparison to previously we are usually defended in the earlier centuries only very small limited spots like important point a port or a choke point yeah and the atlantic wall in a, in some ways it avoids the it manages to avoid the the problem that resulted that you had with places like fort drum and singapore and oscarborg where they could just be circumvented you couldn't circumvent the atlantic wall because of it was a wall <laughs> for, 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 for lack of a better term but that then led to its own problems as we talked about earlier of the fact that you because it was so long you couldn't concentrate you couldn't be strong in any one place you had to be medium to weak everywhere um so it, it forced the allies to deal with them but at the same time also resulted in the batteries being weak enough to actually deal with um because i suspect if you'd gone back gone back in time to a year and a half or two years beforehand and and told the germans in no uncertain terms of where the allied landing was going were going to go and assuming the allies then don't change their minds as a result and they managed to concentrate all the guns in the atlantic wall into those five beaches off of the Nor on the Normandy coast, it might have been a different story. So, so in 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 a way, the the Atlantic Wall was not necessarily a paper tiger, but it was just they couldn't be everywhere. Yeah, I mean the the Atlantic Wall. It could have held off an amphibious assault from anyone but the combined naval power of Britain and America. It was just unfortunate for them that the only people who were coming after them were the combined naval firepower of britain and america um i mean if if for some in some bizarre world we'd somehow teleported japan into the atlantic and got them to fight fight the the germans i don't think realistically short of short of bringing yamato and musashi into range of coastal u-boats i don't think there's any way the japanese would ever have broken through the atlantic wall um, certainly not given their performance on Wake Island and in the Philippines, but it is what it is. It's very interesting because because it, um, the Atlantic Wall quite often, I it's it's basically that the people write, yeah, it was basically a propaganda thing and not particularly strong, and it was showed. And your perspective is like, okay, it was not as formidable, of course, but it was also not like okay, just like a paper tire. Yeah, no, it definitely wasn't a paper target. It required a massive dedication of allied resources to counter it. They had the resources to counter it, but the fact is that that's a cost in men and material that they wouldn't otherwise have had to have done. And ultimately, it's a case of, realistically speaking, against that kind of invasion, there's not really anything that you could realistically do as Nazi Germany to form an unbreakable defence. Yeah. because the allies can just bring more firepower to bear than you can possibly install um so i guess you could argue from that perspective 
any defense is pointless because it's never going to succeed. But at the same time, you don't you you if you're trying to win a war, you don't win a war by giving up. Um, and if you can, you do the best you can. And uh, yeah, maybe there, there could have been better ways of defending um, the Atlantic War with, but that would have required better intelligence. So with what they had, the Atlantic War was probably about as best yeah. as you could have expected them to do. Um, it's just that it wasn't enough. Yeah. But just because it wasn't enough doesn't mean that it was completely ineffective. I mean, one one major problem was the lack of of air superiority or even proper air cover because you could say, okay, you go for a more dynamic defense that you bring in your panzer divisions. You have behind the the, the staging area, you have some staging areas there. But the thing is, they couldn't particularly move during the day, so you need to rely on static defenses to a large degree. Yeah, yeah, and it's and yeah, and it's this sort of it's it's always the case of. Um, it's it's very easy to look in hindsight and say, oh well, clearly this was never going to work. Um, but at the time, it's going to be less clear. Yeah. And and as I say, it's like, especially when you consider that um, by the time you're looking at 1944, Germany was at least some parts of German high command were seriously looking at some kind of negotiated settlement. Yeah. It's it makes an awful lot more sense when you're looking at in that perspective of how can we make the enemy bleed enough that they would rather come to a settled peace than a than a kind of treaty of versailles type situation um, which they wanted to avoid yeah i mean this is the point that everyone was running out of manpower mm. the, the 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 i think churchill basically noted okay we can do the normandy invasions but then we have to rely on the americans for the for the majority of manpower and even the soviets at some points had problems with manpower so yeah, yeah. War, war is generally, generally with industrialized nations is not is not one like it was in ancient times where you march into the enemy's capital and behead their their ruler. It's more a case of which one of you runs out of energy first. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if if you're on the defensive, you have a defensive advantage. So a in theory, a lesser power militarily can force a, a larger power to the table if they can make it hurt enough yeah because uh, because the attacker must deliver a knockout blow whereas defender just needs to stay on his foot yeah and i mean that to be honest that's kind of in a way almost encapsulates almost almost not all obviously you've got things like uh, strategic control areas like gibraltar but almost all coastal fortifications can be summed up in that way it's like yes we know that the enemy can probably overwhelm us if they really want to but can we make them bleed enough that they don't want to try yeah. it's the, is that is that deterrent the deterrent effect um and the effectiveness of that varies obviously throughout time as we've seen and even within a within a single war like world war ii it, the effectiveness of coastal artillery varies greatly depending on who you're fighting and what you've got to hand but there's there's always a justification for it uh, certainly at that kind of time period and of course there's the the great unanswered question of the the massive 14 and 16 inch gun batteries that the americans installed around the panama canal which were never tested um but were obviously designed for a knockdown drag out fight and it's uh, i think this, the the whole coastal thing is uh coastal batteries and coastal fences yeah I can really see more it's more on the naval strategy and naval thinking side than on the the land warfare aspect, which is land warfare is generally I would say faster and uh, focused yeah on 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 another aspect where the naval as I always say naval strategy is build strategy and a lot more focus on deterrent and and also cost in a in a different sense than land warfare. I can't yeah. put my finger down right now, but yeah, this is yeah. And I mean, it it also depend, depends on the nation as well, because if you're if you're a large continental nation like America or Russia or Germany or France, coastal defense is only ever going to be a part of what your 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 overall strategic needs are, because even if you had no coastal defences at all, or all your coastal defences were overwhelmed, at least in this reality, ships can't go onto land. Yeah. Um, so 
you could be blockaded and like France was during the Napoleonic period. But that's about as far as the enemy can go. Um, yes, the, they can land an army on your soil, but at that point it becomes a land engagement, as you, as you mentioned, and then a land strategy is a completely different thing. Yeah. Um, whereas, so basically you're using your coastal batteries, it's defenses to try and basically just preserve that coastline. And it's, again, then it's more about your, your military and commercial interests on the coast in ports and harbors. Whereas if you're uh, a country like Britain, which relies on the sea, or even somewhere like Norway, which to a large degree is either affected by or, or has a large percentage of its population near the sea, it suddenly becomes a whole lot more important. Um, which is ironic, actually, given that of all the various countries <laughs> that we've discussed, Britain is actually probably the single worst off for coastal defences of in its own on its own land. But then they they kind of just obviously took the approach of having as many ships as yeah. possible and just keeping them away in the first place. Not that that tended to work all the time. <laughs> we just throw ships at you. We don't need coastal defences. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, come come. Yeah, if you, if you manage to sneak past our ships. Uh, well, we can throw rocks at you and send you an angrily worded letter, and that's probably about it. <laughs> Is there anything to add? For not for, for World War Two, I think we've probably covered most of it. Um, the the only thing I can think of is just to sort of, to wrap up the whole coastal artillery, coastal fortification thing. Since we did start back in the fourteen hundreds, um, was <laughs> would be the uh, yeah, sort of post World War Two. Once you've got uh, missiles, rockets guided weaponry and that that kind of thing the the coastal artillery becomes weaker and weaker um it's because of that it's that whole again that fixed part of it um once you've got uh fast jets and and guided missiles and laser guided bombs and stuff like that it's far too easy to take them out um and so you start to, you see coastal artillery generally dies off very quickly after World War Two as these technologies um, come into play. Uh, a few batteries are kept around um, by various nations. Some of them aren't decommissioned until well after the Cold War, but they're always very much secondary uh, defenses at that point. Um, only a few a few nations, mostly in Scandinavia, build new coastal defences after World War II that use guns, and they rely massively on camouflage, um, extremely heavy armour, and all sorts of new technology for rapid firing, um, because they get, they've only got one or two places to defend. Modern-day coastal fortification-coastal artillery is mostly done these days by mobile surface-to-surface -surface missile launchers. So... And and you, we we have we've seen that being used, but again, it, almost kind of like the torpedo boat uh, and the minefield. I mean, mines are still obviously in use, but the, like the torpedo boat at the beginning of the twentieth century, these days the the fast missile boat supplements the the, the road mounted surface surface missile launcher in the coastal fortification role. But again, we're back to that same old thing of uh, cost cost versus durability in in the face of. Uh, what's most likely going to be overwhelming naval and now air su uh, superiority. Yeah, uh, I think there's not much to add here. Thank you very much for this great podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to uh, talk, talk to you. Having, having watched your channel for a very long time, uh, it's, uh, it's always fun to actually talk to the person behind, behind the YouTube, as it were.